Hey, this is Madeline Sklar. And Suze Cooper, and you're listening to All Things Audio. I'm excited about today's All Things Audio. We have a lot of stuff to talk about today. Yeah, it's it's bumper again, everyone. It is definitely another bumper edition. I came across this really interesting uh, tweet from Adweek, and they had this interview with... Um, Let's see, who is that? Alex Josephson from Twitter. And he was talking about Twitter spaces and the use of audio. And I thought he mentioned some really cool things here. I just wanted to, you know, share with you all because, you know, this really kind of brings it all together with the whole social audio and, and, you know, why we're so committed to sharing all this stuff with you guys week after week. Um, He made these interesting comments, said, Audio brings an additional layer to the public conversation that has been taking place for years. A huge challenge that people face on social is understanding context and nuance, and there's no real substitute for hearing human intonation. Isn't that just so well said, Suze? I love that. Yeah, it's really well put. And, you know, we've spoken about um, the power of the human voice uh, for connection. Uh, It is that very first mode of communication for us as human beings and what social audio does is brings that into this social realm for us so we can all talk to each other and uh, really make those connections using those real kind of human qualities that you just can't create in any other way you know hearing someone's voice and then reacting to that all the detail that you get in somebody's voice when they're talking you know the emotion as it says there the, the nuance um that you know just there's so much meaning and detail in someone's voice and conversation and that's what this extra layer now brings to social media rather than trying to work out whether or not that tweet or that post what were they trying to say there or you know misreading it or um not quite understanding the context in which it was written hopefully some of that's removed by the fact that we can now hear each other um and and hear all of that the beauty that is in each of our voices from, you know, our accents that that say a lot about where we're from, um, you know, a bit about who we are, all the way through to the language that we use, the words that we choose. All of that is such a human and personal quality that we bring to all of this experience. So I, I think I, I love what he says here. And, you know, authenticity has been a real kind of a bit of a buzzword really. Exactly. For the last couple of years on social media, I would say, you know, it's all about being being real and being authentic and being your real self. But there's not really been until now a channel to really push that. And I feel like audio is that step towards that aspiring to being that authentic person on the platforms. What do you, what do you think, Madeline? Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. That's why I've just been so thrilled that in the past year, it's just been all about this social audio, you know, clubhouse really got going last December. That was when I remember the big influx of everybody joining. And then Twitter Spaces was like literally right around the corner from that. It started right after the first of the year. I mean, I started doing a beta hosting in February um, of earlier this year. And it's just such an amazing way to connect with people. You know, I've been doing digital marketing for a very, very long time. People can tell from my tweets and my articles and even if they see me do presentations, whether it's webinars or in person, you know, I'm very passionate about sharing my knowledge. And I love how we can, you know, use these audio platforms and it just really brings it all home. I mean, people can hear me talk about these things and they really know how much I care about helping people and sharing um, all that passion comes through from voice. And I, I'm just like, just blown away. Like, look how much has happened in the past year with these social audio platforms and our involvement with it. And it's nice to see so many people jumping on board with this and getting comfortable with it. And uh, now every time I open up my mobile app for Twitter, I see so many more rooms going on. And I see rooms growing and getting bigger and bigger and really interesting and more brands and more journalists using it. And it's just amazing. And I just love it. I think it's really interesting. I mean, if you think about even 
kind of our relationship, if you like, Madeline. So I joined the Twitter Smarter Chat a few years ago when I was doing some social media management work. Someone recommended it to me. I jumped on board. I came into the chat. I was there fairly frequently, week in, week out. It was a wonderful space to be in a great community. But all of that was built via via text, via words on a screen, which is incredible that you can build that via a hashtag, essentially. So huge round of applause to you, Madeline, because you are definitely the queen of that. Thank you. But what this then does, you know, from that, I then went on to listen to your content on your podcast. Now, when I'm listening to your podcast, you're talking just to me, right? Like, there's no one else listening to that podcast when I'm listening to it. That's recorded just for me. And that's the way that podcasting kind of works, because everybody feels like they've got their, you know, they're an individual being spoken to by those hosts. It's a very individual um, experience. So when social audio comes along and suddenly we can actually speak to one another and we can then broaden that out and um, kind of create a community, if you like, which is what I feel we've got here with with all things audio, with people that then come along and listen live and can then chat, you know, to see that change over the last few years has just been incredible. And what it does at each step, I think, is just bring that um, relationship closer at each step because you, you're you're hearing more from that person, you're understanding more right up to the space where you're having a conversation with them. And, you know, that's that's the, the ultimate in, in communication. The other thing I love about this Adweek um, tweet is that um, the guy says, people who interact for the first time in Twitter spaces tend to reconnect in DMs after the space has ended. And I think that's really interesting as well, that, you know, it's about, it's not just about a relationship in that moment, in that space. It's about connecting with those people afterwards and actually moving forward to build a, a stronger relationship with them. So, so yeah, I mean, social audio has certainly brought a whole lot of joy to my life <laughs> this year and has, you know, introduced me to people I may never have met otherwise. And I'm very grateful for it. Um, and there's lots of reasons and lots of stories I'm sure of people making different connections in different ways because of spaces and because they've been able to talk to different people around the world. Exactly. And and I agree with this whole, you know, DMs that people are using that after they've been in spaces. This past year, my DMs have blown up so much and it's been such a great way to deepen relationships with people because, you know, th- this statement is so true. After I speak in a room or host in a room or co-host, I'm always chatting with people in the DMs. It usually is someone who was there for the first time that will reach out and say, what a great room that was, or, hey, I have a question, or can you address this issue next time? It's just such a great communication tool, and it's really just been that great extension of the room. The room ends. Now what? Well, now, you know, you have that ability to use the power of DMs to keep that conversation going. Yeah. And I really love that. After us, even just after our space is finished, I love going through the notifications, checking out the DMs. There's always someone to respond to, always someone to continue the conversation with. Um, so yeah, for you, Madeline, running three spaces a week, I can imagine it could be a full-time job. <laughs> um, but you know, it's lovely to hear from, from people and to, to make those connections. Absolutely. Now, you found some really interesting articles that we're going to look at um, talking about some negative things about spaces and and things going on with Twitter. I'm going to put these up in the nest so everybody can check these out. Uh, This first one from the Washington Post. What was your take on this? Because it was an interesting article. It was, yeah. And I I think, as we've just been saying there about how you know, Spaces gives this platform and allows us all to build communities and talk to one another, that there is a negative side to that in terms of some people are going to abuse that platform or are going to try and take what what Spaces is to get across perhaps a, a, a stronger and more political point of view. So this particular Washington Post article is talking about um, racists and Taliban supporters taking to Spaces and getting really rather large audiences and beyond that how Twitter have actually reacted to and handled that Um, and it's kind of uncovered something that I've been a bit concerned about for a, a number of weeks really having asked the question myself of Twitter as to how spaces were being moderated or dealt with if they'd been reported by someone and not 
kind of heard anything back on it. Um, now, this particular Washington Post article, it's a long one. I encourage you to go along and read it. Obviously, we always like people to go along and read the links, make your, your own decisions and choices. What we're doing here is kind of putting them in your way, if you like, for you to have a look at. Um, I think, yeah, the, the, the key for me here is how Twitter police these chats and how it's moderated and the fact that it's come through that there is no moderation and it's not being particularly well policed. And that actually Twitter knows that um, and they're, they're scrabbling by the sound of it to try and work out what to do about it. Um, it feels as though from this article that they're saying, I mean, we've said it week after week, there's a new feature, there's a new functionality, we're excited about it, they're pushing stuff out, the product team must be going bananas, it must be growing by you know tenfold every week because of all the stuff that they're doing. But it would appear that potentially they've been concentrating a lot on getting those features and functions out and potentially, you know, concerns around how to moderate um, extremist spaces, if you like, have kind of fallen on deaf ears. And therefore, they're kind of now in this situation where, yeah, they're trying to backtrack and work out what they can do in terms of what happens when a, a space is reported. Um yeah, Madeline, I mean, what's kind of your take on on what was said here? Yeah, well, I mean, there's not going to be any perfect system, that's for sure. I mean, Clubhouse before Spaces, I mean, they had their issues with the hate speech and the bullying and, and things like that as well. Um, the platform gives us the ability to report rooms that are inappropriate or, or you know, with something not right. And whenever you're in a room, you have the ability on mobile, you have the three dots at the top next to leave. And, and you can report a space. Um, and it's important that, you know, we all do this as we feel it needs to be reported. You know, if you're in a room and, and it's uncomfortable and things are getting out of hand, um, I think that's smart. Um, but I mean, this does, you know, talk about this other side, like the negative thing when it comes to social audio. And, and you know, we, we rely on these platforms to do everything they can in their power to try to keep people as safe and give us as much resources as possible to be able to, you know, remove people, block people and report people as needed. So, you know, it, it's going to happen. Unfortunately, it's a shame. I've never experienced that in clubhouse or spaces. Have you? I mean, not to say it doesn't happen. We know it happens, but I haven't ever been in a room where there was anything crazy going on or hate speech. I've read about it. I've seen articles and people talking about it um, in both Clubhouse and Spaces, but I personally have not had it happen while I was in a room. Yeah, I've ha I have been in one room um, over on Clubhouse that was closed down because it was suddenly taken over. Um, to be honest, the people that kind of came in and, and were... Um, had had something to say was shouting so much that to be quite honest the audio was just completely distorted and no one could kind of I'm sure no one could really hear what whatever it was they were trying to say anyway but the space got closed down the thing that I've d certainly done on Twitter and this was kind of in the about three weeks ago there just seemed to be a real kind of influx of titles that really just made me feel uneasy um, and so I did report a few of those titles and that was when I asked the question okay I'm reporting this but where does that go? What what happens? Like, have, are you have you got moderators on the other end of this? Is it being looked at by bot? What's what's kind of happening once I make a report? And actually, you know, in terms of anonymity as well, like, how does that work? I mean, I'm kind of assuming that I'm going to report this space and not get any backlash anywhere. But there was nothing suggesting there was nothing telling me anything about the reporting process anywhere. Um, and as I say, I kind of didn't get anything back on it. And then these articles. Um, you know, there's one on CNET th that's here as well. And the Washington Post one have have come around. Um, and basically within this article, it says these chats are neither police nor moderated by Twitter, the company acknowledges, because it does not have human moderators or technology that can scan the audio in real time. So they are really relying on people within spaces and people on Twitter to report this potential rule breaking content. Um but they don't actually have anything that's detecting any kind of negative keywords or, or harmful content um, set up because it kind of doesn't exist. And again, this is where audio is kind of racing ahead of itself almost. Um, 
there's certain elements of tech and there's stuff certainly being developed, but it's not in such a state at the moment that it can be used. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's only fair to read as well that, that Twitter actually gave a, a statement. It says in a statement after the story published, um, they said the moderation plan for spaces included prioritising reports of problematic audio conversations for review and the company's created a separate team to moderate audio after it receives reports. It says it's working on building technological tools to enforce its rules proactively. So it's certainly on their table now, Madeline. And what they do next, um, I'm sure there's a lot of people that will be watching very closely. I agree. And I mean, and we'll be watching closely as well. We'll, we'll you know, keep you guys informed of anything new that comes about from this. So, yeah, we've got two articles here. We'll also have it in the show notes for the podcast. Um, I'm excited about this next piece of news that uh, the New York Times is uh, opening up a, a, an audio app for beta testers with the plan to launch next year. This sounds quite interesting. I'm a big fan of the New York Times. Yeah, so this is an iOS app um, from the New York Times. Um, I'm sure lots of people will have listened to the daily and, you know, it's it's basically there as a kind of flagship for all of the audio content that the New York Times is creating. Um, and there's quite a lot of it. You know, this this app kind of sections it out um, into, into different areas. Um, you can listen to the podcasts. Um, they've got a today tab. They've got kind of short um, bite sized audio if that's what you need on the go. But it brings it all into one app um, and makes it really super easy for for anyone who's kind of a, a fan of their audio content to to get to and to use. So I think it's a really smart idea to bring um, all the audio together into one app. Over here, we've got um, BBC Sounds is kind of a, a similar thing, I guess, uh, whereby any of the podcasts, the radio shows um, produced by the BBC, you can download the BBC Sounds app and it's all kind of there. You can search by radio station or, or, or um, podcast title. Um, and it's kind of pretty, pretty neat. I mean, for them, I'm wondering whether or not it's a way of um, getting some some ownership of, of statistics and stuff. Um, podcasts and audio listening stats are really difficult to nail down at the best of times, particularly when you're looking across lots of different platforms and places. So potentially this is a way of them bringing it all together. They can have a little bit more visibility over um, people that are downloading and, and using because it's it's part of their their own toolkit. But yeah, it looks really neat. And uh, I think it's a great idea to bring all of, the, all of their audio content into one place, um, easily marketable for them as well once once it's there. So yeah, a, about to launch next year. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they have good experience with audio. They they debuted their hit podcast called The Daily four years ago. And in this article, it says it's been downloaded 3.2 billion times. I mean, think about that. That's a lot of downloads. And they say they get over 20 million people listening to his podcast content monthly. So they definitely know how to do audio through podcasting. So this seems like just it, an extension of what they're already doing, like taking this content with the journalists and the editors and putting it into an audio app. I'm, I'm excited. I can't wait for this to come out. I think it'll be really interesting. Yeah, it will also be interesting to see whether or not it ends up as part of kind of their subscription model. I know some of their um, content is kind of paywalled and, and things like that. So um, it'll be interesting to see how it sort of evolves and whether or not there'll be an element in there that is kind of behind the paywall. There are lots of people doing sort of exclusive or bonus podcasts on subscription um, at the moment, trying out that that kind of new model, if you like. And so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see whether this goes the same way as that. But yeah, I mean, certainly in terms of their audio knowledge, the daily is right up there. It's a flagship one that I know lots of, um, you know, lots of news providers will will aspire to and will 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 be looking at. So yeah, it's I think it's a, a good step for them. Definitely. Definitely. So you found an article in TechCrunch that sounds really interesting about a new app called Wisdom. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, so I downloaded this and I've had a little bit of a play about with it. So Wisdom is another social audio app. And every time I hear of one, I do tend to kind of download it and go in and fiddle around and see what what's different about it. Like what is this offering that everybody else isn't offering? Um, this one is saying that it's focusing on life advice. 
um, and allowing people access to mentors. So the idea is that you go in and you can set up uh, a room and you will be giving a talk, essentially. It's a bit like when people say, oh, you know, welcome to my TED talk. Um, it feels a little bit like that. You fill in your little introduction about what your talk is going to be about and away you go and people can then join and listen. Now, it seems to me that you are basically launched into a talk depending on which topics you choose when you set it up. Um, so you're very quickly suddenly listening to something as soon as you enter the app. And the way that you then decide whether or not that's what you want to listen to is literally to swipe. So you kind of swipe right and you're you're in another um, audio room listening to another person. Now, from what I can see, and I haven't spent loads and loads of time in there at the moment, but from what I can see is literally the the person who has set up the space with wh whichever topic it is that they're talking on and one guest. So, um, and, and you can you can kind of uh, apply if you like to be the guest by by clicking on the microphone. Um, I haven't quite worked out what the how how that how that works yet. I haven't. I haven't actually hit the mic to see whether or not I would go up and, and, and be a guest. But um, yeah, certainly people can listen. You can swipe right, find an, a new a new topic to listen to. It's a different way of doing it. Um, it's certainly trying to uh, gear itself towards, you know, people who've got something sort of very key to say um, and want, want an audience to say it to. But it, it's been given, um, the reason it was in the news and the reason that it's in this TechCrunch article is that it's been given $2 million in seed funding. Um, so, you know, the, the creators have obviously got big plans for it. It is a UK-based startup and, yeah, they're, they're, they're going on this kind of one-to-one -one conversation and are moving from there. But, yeah, $2 million, they, they've clearly got plans for it. So it's definitely one I'm going to keep an eye on. Yeah, it's really interesting. I love wisdom. I think that's a great name for what they're trying to do. And I love how they're niching down. And it seems like that's what some of these newer audio apps are doing. They're like really niching down to a very specific group or audience. So uh, definitely be watching that one to see where it goes. Yeah, for sure. I'm just reading down the article now and it does say it will be available as an Android app in the new year. So as ever, it's doing a kind of dual phase on device um, in terms of the rollout. But but yeah, one to watch. And now we have Clubhouse news. So you, you've you uncovered some interesting tidbits about Clubhouse that we can talk about. Yeah, just a, just a few things on Clubhouse. They've added a new toggle onto Clubhouse so that you can hide those rooms that are not safe for work. You can also now see a room's um, cumulative audience count. So beforehand um, that was only actually visible to the people who had spun up the room uh, whereas now everyone should be able to see how many people have have listened um, into the room which is um, a neat thing I guess I'm, I'm not sure that I'm really bothered by how many people have listened to a room but I guess I don't know it could be useful what do you think does it does it matter to you how many people have listened it matters more to me whether it's something I want to hear right yeah, I, I'm kind of mixed on that. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that if it's necessary to show that or not. It, it's interesting. I mean, of course, creator wants to know, but it it, are, it already is available to the creator. Mm, yeah, exactly. So I, I'm not sure that that would particularly um, draw me into a room to 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 see high numbers. But then, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm guessing it probably will do for some people. Yeah. Um, and they have also um, improved the room composer for those on Android. I'm not and on Android, so I can't see that. But I'm wondering whether or not Morgan might have more to update us on potentially um, once we open the, the mics later on and, and let us know anything else that we might have missed on, on Clubhouse recently. Yeah, definitely would love to hear his take on all that. And then um, you um, shared here, I'm going to put in the nest, this really interesting article talking about, you know, how you can record your own audio in spaces or clubhouse. Um, and we've talked about that before here in this room. You know, you and I record, we record ourselves for the podcast and there's a variety of ways to record. But this article I thought was really interesting you know, showing like different types of equipment. There, there's a variety of ways to do this. I mean, you and I both know that. We, we've had our share of experimenting with different things. Did you find the way they framed it in this article? Like, did you think this way, since you're more the audio expert than me, did you find this to be a good way of, 
of connecting yourself with a good microphone, XLR microphone, and and using a mixer to be in a room. And this was a um, an article that was posted in a space that I, you know, one of those random spaces, random moments where I just jumped into it, and actually it was a it was a really good hour. A really nice group of people that were in there talking about recording Twitter spaces. Um, Michael, who I think was in our space last week as a listener, um, who's at Audio Mentor, Mentor, sorry, and um, John Ong, who I have heard them over on Clubhouse talking um, about different things, but they they jumped over onto Spaces anyway. And uh, for John, it seemed like it was a very early experience for on Twitter Spaces for him, and they were talking about you know, how they record stuff over on Clubhouse and how that totally translates over here on Spaces. And, you know, I guess in the early in the early days, Madeline, I mean, honestly, we're, we're only, we're still less than a year into this experience, right. but <laughs> it was one of those topics that we definitely spoke about kind of every single week was kind of like, how do we get this audio to record here? And how do we get this to talk to that? And which cable do we need? And I mean, bless you, Madeline, you sent me several videos at one point to show me how you were set up so that I could try and figure out how to set up what I had over here. Um, And eventually we did it. I mean, it still doesn't work as seamlessly as I would like, mainly because of all the faders and equipments and mixing desks that I've got. Ultimately, my issue is that my iPhone XR doesn't have a headphone jack. And that is a big issue when you're trying to record, you know, both put audio into your phone and then take all of it back out and record it in a decent quality. Um, So anyway, what Michael and John were talking about were the different ways that you could do this and the different equipment that you could use. And um, Michael has put together this this article online, which basically gives an awful lot of different solutions, um, kind of different price ranges of equipment. Um, What it doesn't do very clearly is explain how one connects to the other. Um, oh, he's he's updated it. So look at that. It does now explain how to connect one to the other slightly more clearly using emojis. Um, when I looked at it on uh, on the weekend, when, when I first found it, it didn't have the little graphic that it now has on it. But um, aside from that, it does have various things like which cables you might want. It's got some advice there on headphones and microphones. Um, Certainly the key bit of kit for me has been the uh, adapter from the iPhone uh, so that I can actually plug a a three and a half millimeter um, port into there without too much fuss. Um, Yeah, it's it's a neat little um, article. I think it's worth having a look through if you are thinking of recording. I still think that the only real straightforward and consistent way of doing this is the Rodecaster Pro, which is an expensive bit of kit. But I mean, I have tried several different ways with several different cables and bits of kit that I have here. And believe me, there's a lot of kit. But in to get a consistent um, signal into and out of spaces and be able to record it all at once, I still still think that the roadcaster is your all in one um that probably does it all in the most straightforward and simple way but yeah an interesting one to look at if you're thinking about recording spaces we do also have the native record now which makes a huge difference because we didn't have that at all just a few months ago um so yeah it's it's an interesting one to look at absolutely and for some of us we're able to record our rooms like you and i have the ability so this room is being recorded But the playback is just listening to it, streaming. We can't download it. And I'm hoping at some point they'll give us as the host the ability to like download and have that as an MP3 that we can then do something with afterwards instead of trying to go get it through your Twitter data, which is not the easiest. I've had too many problems. I can't get it to work on my end. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm using Backstage by Headliner to get the... um download of the full space so I put the the url of the space into backstage before we start um it records it as we're speaking and then in about five minutes after we've finished I'm able to actually save that audio down it's not fantastic quality but I mean it's what we use um if we use any of the spaces audio uh within the podcast that's what you'll hear it will be from from that feed so it's more than good enough to listen to again and and replay um, and at the moment, that's my easiest solution, because as you say, the, the data solution, just it's just too clunky, <laughs> too much of a clunky process. 
And another option for recording and transcripts is using Otter, which is otter.ai and George Silverman, who's here. Uh, we always utilize that on his account every Saturday when he helps co-host Twitter audits with me and Dariana. Um, George always records it, which is nice because as soon as it's over, you can have that recorded copy with the transcript, just like Headliner. Headliner, same thing. They, they look different, but they do the same thing. So there, there's lots of tools out there that can help you when it comes to recording and transcripts, if that's something you're trying to do. Yeah, much easier to download the transcript from Otter as well than it is at the moment on Headliner. I think they're still working on how you can get access to the, uh, to the transcript. Yeah, it still feels very beta to me. It is. They're still testing it out. They're still taking feedback. But they're, but they're getting there. They are. Slowly, but yes. <laughs> and we have one last thing to talk about. So Suze has been experimenting with, and it's pretty darn cool. Now, as you guys may know, Suze and I started this challenge, gosh, like three and a half weeks ago, Suze, can you believe it? I, I can't believe how far into this we are now, um, called Voice 100. And the whole, if you go to either of our pen tweets on our profile, we have information about it. We, uh, t for, let's see, today's actually technically day 28. I'm going to update my Twitter name. Uh, when I, I always wait till I do mine for the day, uh, which will be a little later, but, uh, I've been doing, I think, Suze, I'm the only one that has done every single, cause you were sick a few days and that's totally okay. Look, I don't expect anyone to do it perfectly every day, but I've been able to. There were a couple of days where I was like, oh gosh, I need to hurry up and think of something real quick to do as an audio tweet, but um, I've done it every single day. So uh, today will be day 28. So we, so actually that's four weeks. Wow. So we that's right, because it was right after we did this room. So it was four weeks ago from this room that we decided to launch it. It was. And I'm really, I'm really impressed that you've done every day, Madeline. I really am. And I'm really sad that I got unwell in the in the middle of it just as I was starting to to really take on doing it every day and then I, I fell ill and I stopped so yeah I'm a few behind you but I'm, I am going to keep going and um, you know I might reach my hundred a few days after you but I'm, I'm still going to keep doing it I found that I needed something to hang the content around because I was getting to like 10 o'clock at night and about to go to bed and then thinking oh I need to do a voice tweet and then really not knowing what it was I wanted to say so I've started to do some podcast tips. So if anyone in here is interested in setting up a podcast or has a podcast and is thinking about how they can market it better or anything like that, then uh, potentially my, my voice tweets might be for you at the moment. I don't know if it will last for the full 100. I don't know yet, but um, we'll see. But yeah, the thing that I was experimenting with this week, whenever I was doing a voice tweet, I was getting this really kind of, I don't even know what colour it was really, a sort of pinky, beigey, wasn't a colour I'd have chosen, to be honest, as the voice card, um, as the kind of card that goes around my profile picture. And I didn't like it. So I was trying to work out if I could change it in some way. Um, and I, I kind of thought it might have something to do with whatever the main colour in your profile picture was. So because my profile picture is quite a close close up of my face I think it was picking up on my skin colour and making that the background of my voice card so you'll now notice that I have a quite horrendous bright pink background and that is for the only key reason that I wanted it to pick up when I did a voice card um so yeah and and it worked it, I, I changed the background and my card is now pink so it would appear that if you do want to change the colour of your voice card you need to do something to your profile picture with a colour that you really like and hope that it will pick it up. Um, I'm not sure how much of your profile picture needs to be that colour. I know, Madeline, you tried it and didn't have quite so much success. Um, but yeah, it, it seems to pick up on that. Yeah, I had no success. I, I think what it's doing is is picking the majority of the colour. And if it's, you know, many of us have our headshot up close. And so in that case, it's going to do, I think, skin tone. And so I have... My same profile picture, when I first got on Clubhouse last December, I noticed very quickly that what a lot of people started doing was making the background of their headshot stand out in Clubhouse, right? So I tried different color backgrounds, did all kinds of stuff. And I had this really nice blue one I was using. And so I put it on here on Twitter and it didn't look like it was enough blue to change the color. And sure enough, it didn't change it. it it's still... I think it's just pulling the tones from my hair and my face and using that. 
Whereas I think your photo works because there's pink in your hair quite a bit. And then you have that pink background. So it, I guess it told, I don't know, the AI or algorithm, however, they have this behind the scenes to make that pink background for the Twitter card, which I love. I love that because it stands out. Most of these are just block colors. And I wish they would give us the ability to pick a color, right? Like I have a color picker. It'd be really good to brand them. I mean, a, a lot of us on here, certainly in the sort of digital marketing, social media space, you know, we're, we're kind of building a bit of a brand, a bit of an idea of what we look like, what we sound like, all of those kind of things. And it matters to us. We don't, we don't want it to not look right. You know, when you think about what your header looks like and, and you know, you choose your pictures for a, a certain reason, your logo's on there or whatever, you want this to tie in with that. At least that's how I felt. Um, so I figured if there was if there was a way, I wanted to find it. So it's a bit of a a, a hack, a bit of a tip. Um, so yeah, go go and go and have a play. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Hi George, how are you? Hey, how are you? Thanks, thanks for the shout out. Before um, I have a couple of very quick things. Um, one, Suze, if you're trying to connect, or anybody who's trying to connect an iPhone to a board like the Roadcaster, I use the uh, Zoom before. Um, the only way I was able to do it, I have an older iPhone and a, a 10, um, with Zoom's help, uh, Zoom Audio, not the other Zoom, uh, you can't do it with, with, with a 3.5 millimeter plug. You have to do it through Bluetooth. Tooth which is an extra $50 doohickey that goes on the side. Uh, but Bluetooth works perfectly. I'm using an XLR microphone right now. Uh, it's going into the mixer. My phone is connected to the mixer by Bluetooth, and it works just perfectly both ways. It's record being recorded by Otter um, on my laptop, which is also plugged into the whole thing. thing works like a charm. Um, three, I, for three weeks, I tried to get it to work hardwire with the with the phone plug wouldn't work. Even the Zoom people got on the phone with me, walked me through it. I went to the Apple store, plugged all my stuff to the Apple store. They tried it. We could never get it to work. But Bluetooth works like a charm and it's one one less wire. So it works perfectly. Yeah. So if you're absolutely trying to connect something, th think of Bluetooth because you don't think tend to think of it because it's not that, you know, supposedly not great fidelity, but it is. It's fine. Uh, the other piece of news real quick is I took the liberty of posting it to the nest. Uh, yesterday, I ran what is, I think, as far as I know, uh, if anybody, please let me know, uh, the first focus group, fo formal focus group, real focus group on Twitter spaces. Uh, those of you who don't know, uh, I'm the inventor of the telephone focus group. We used to do them 50 years ago by telephone conference call. So I decided... Yeah, why not just try a regular focus group? It was on your your experiences with spaces as a listener. Your first experiences, what you liked about it, what got you coming back, or what keeps you coming back, why haven't you uh, participated more, why haven't you hosted at all. I uh, talked about people's, you know, so I did post in the in the nest some some of the findings. Some people said things I thought particularly well certainly differently than I've been saying them over the years, and I think way better than I've been saying them. Um, and uh, in talking about the authenticity of the human voice and how you can tell somebody's a real person and all that, um, it was really eye-opening. And I, I put the Otter link in there uh, so if any of you want to hear what a real focus group sounds like, it's kind of a hybrid focus group, question group, because a lot of people were asking me questions about what focus groups are and how they work and all that. But it was a focus group, and I'll be, I will definitely be doing more of them. It was a very positive experience. I think it's a, a whole new use of spaces to do re group research interviews of groups of people in an inter highly interactive mode. If it's not interactive, it ain't a focus group. So I don't have to justify my preferences for interactive mode. That's what a focus group is. That's what it was invented for. And it, it really were. It, it, I think we got definitely got proof of principle. Not that it can't be done a whole lot better. Uh, we'll learn to do it better. But uh, I urge you to hear it. 
Thanks. Thanks for sharing that, George. I put the other tweet in the nest where you actually have the link to honor for this. And that, that sounds amazing. So thank you for, for doing this and sharing it with us. I'm very intrigued. Maria, hello. Nice to, nice to have you here. How are you? I am fantastic. Hello. This is the first time I've ever spoken in one of these spaces. Oh, so you're I've been trying. Welcome. Hey, bravo. <laughs> Thank you so much. We love it when that happens. (laughs) Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for trusting me and bringing me up onto the stage or whatever you call it here on Twitter. I'm very familiar with Clubhouse and Facebook and yada yada, but um, Twitter is a little new to me and so fascinating because all of this techie stuff. I just kind of love it. I'm kind of a techie geek that way. And so this is, you had me at Roadcaster. I was like, because I have a podcast. I'm really a meditation teacher. And um, I did workshops and such before the pandemic started. And I've been getting more into the audio space. But my comment right now, just to keep it brief and get straight to the point was, I was so intrigued. And the reason I I raised my hand or whatever it's called in here is because I just wanted to comment. I really appreciate your insights on how to use those audio shares here on Twitter. I have two questions. It sounds like you're still figuring out how to change the background because I am very brave and I have done a couple of those audio shares here on Twitter. But yes, I did not like the color that was behind my profile picture. I also, my question, I guess, is are you finding that a lot of people stop and listen to audio on Twitter or do you think they kind of scroll past because they're looking for a quick fix of words only? What is your feeling about that? And then I'll mute myself. Thank you. No, brilliant, brilliant questions. So um, I think what I find with audio tweets is that they've actually got a longer lifespan potentially than your text tweets. So I might find that I do a voice tweet and it might get, you know, single figure listens over the next kind of hour or so. But if I look back at that after a week, it's probably got like 30, 40, maybe even 50 listens. And so somehow it seems to build up its own head of steam over time. Um, where the, I mean, Madeline can definitely talk about Twitter way, way better than I can in terms of, you know, how fast a, a tweet disappears. I think, um, I think I seem to remember something about a tweet having, a text tweet having a lifespan of something like 18 minutes on a, on a timeline. And to be honest, I think that's probably quite, quite long. I think there's so much content being pushed through that it's probably shorter than that. But for me, that's what I find. I find that it's got a longer lifespan and that people listen over time. What do you think, Madeline? Really interested to hear what you think. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because when we're doing these audio tweets, it's technically media and media tweets seem to have a further reach. Uh, uh, There's no exact science behind it. Like I can't sit here and say like, you know, how many minutes longer or anything like that, because I really don't know. Twitter doesn't divulge that information. But it, it, media tweets, and that's going to be your videos, your GIFs, and then these audio tweets uh, tend to have a, a longer lifespan. Um, and th- But of course, with any tweet, you can always retweet it to push it back up in the stream. And one of the strategies I've been doing with our, our daily Voice 100 tweets um, is that I'll do my tweet, my audio tweet, you know, when I do it each day. But I also want to add it to my pen tweet because I want to like keep this record of 100 days worth of these audio tweets and be able to go back through it. But then also for other people to be able to go back through them as well. So one strategy I've been doing is, and this has just been from trial and error. It, It was like, okay, do I just keep adding my audio tweet to this thread every day. So that means it's not a standalone tweet. It's an actual, I just hit reply to my pin tweet and then it turns into a thread. But I found with me, and this is not with everybody, but, but some people experience what I experience, which is I don't get nearly as much engagement because it's not its own tweet is attached to another tweet into a thread. So what my big experiment has been with voice 100 this past month is I'll do my tweet as a standalone, 
But then I will, at the bottom of any tweet, whether you're on mobile or desktop, there's a little share button. So I click on share and I hit copy link to tweet. And then what I do is I schedule it to get added to this thread hours later. So it'll bring that tweet back up in the thread, in the, in the feed. So more people will see it. And I mean, I'm basically doing, you know, two things into turning two things into one. I'm doing a strategy to help me get more engagement and, and more of a boost behind that audio tweet and thread it later into the pen tweet. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Yes, this is Maria again. I love yeah. that. And, and I love the delay on it as well, because as we all know, we have a certain amount of energy for social media in general, and then we need our downtime. And so that kind of makes it last longer too and doesn't bombard the audience as much. Sometimes exactly. I'll be I'll be so on fire. I'm like, I'm gonna make an Instagram live and a TikTok and la 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 la. And then if the same people are following me on the different platforms, they're gonna get tired of seeing me. <laughs> so it's like scattering it a little bit more. Exactly. That's brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm a big fan of like scheduling out some of the content so that you can just hit up different time zones and different parts of the day instead of just tweeting a whole bunch of things at once into your feed. So back to how I'm I'm adding this into this thread of tweet every day. So I do my standalone audio tweet. And at the bottom, I hit the little share, I copy the URL, copy link to tweet is what I'm doing. Then I go into my pinned tweet, and I, sc I scroll all the way down to the very last one because I'm just I just keep adding it to whatever is the last one. So I click on here, scroll way down because you know now there's so many of these daily tweets, and all I'm doing is getting to the very last one. So for yesterday that was number 27. So I go find that one and then I hit reply to it, or at the bottom of it I'll also say add another tweet. You can just tap that as well, and then I put the I just paste the URL in. And on desktop, you can schedule right in there. So I write in the composed tweet. So I schedule it to go out later in the evening. So now I'm going to, you know, repurpose that tweet and add it to the thread. So now, you know, I can easily go back and see all of these daily tweets in one place. Brilliant. Um, well, Morgan, hello. Let's talk about Clubhouse. I'll run for it. Hi, both. Hi, Morgan. Okay, well, we'll start at the top. So that very quickly, the, the not safe for work toggle uh, is, is, is kind of good. I, I'm going to consider this as a partly a moderation step. It cleans up the hallway somewhat, uh, but it's also part of this longer term thing of trying to get things ready for opening the app up to people who are 13 and over, uh, which is a, a separate thing that something I spotted on Twitter, which kind of goes back to the moderation thing here, which I haven't heard discussed yet. Um, as far as I know, it, Twitter's 13 and over policy also applies to spaces. So um, I saw a space the other day, which was a, in the title, it was a 14-year-old anything. So I think yeah, this, this kind of concern about young users on the platform is, is one that Clubhouse are trying to do something about before they open it up to people who are younger than 18. So that's what that's for. Um, how it works is it, it's done algorithmically. Uh, but a creator can also add it to a room if they want to explicitly. Um, so that's that. The the one on total seeing total participants. Um, so you don't actually see this until you're in the room. So it doesn't. It's not something that gives you a reason to enter a room. You can't see how many people have passed through it from the hallway. Um, and you should probably think of it in terms of YouTube views. So it's basically. I mean, they they refer to them as total participants rather than total listeners. But you can assume mostly it's listeners. Um, but because the live room is, is matched with the replay, and this is becoming very common now, all, almost all major live rooms are now replayed, and replays are beginning to take off in terms of consumption, that you as a creator do want to know how many people in total have listened to you. So it's, it's a bit like a download statistic for a podcast or a, a view stat for YouTube. And this is, of course, going to be a, a part of the monetization push that's going to come early next year. It's the early stage of the analytics. So for a certain class of creators, they're going to want to take this figure and approach sponsors, let's say, or if they're doing brand partnerships, 
they need to be able to say, look, here, here's how my rooms are growing. Here's a month how many people listen. And I think what is Clubhouse will start to make some noise next year where they'll say, hey, look, more people are listening to the typical replay on Clubhouse than listen to the top 5% of podcasts. Um, so there was there was some interesting stat about, I, it, you'll probably know it better than me, but it's something like 5% of podcasts get over 3,000 listeners within the first month. And I think Clubhouse is going to say, well, look, many of our rooms get over 3,000 listeners in the first month. So, hey, podcasters, why don't you come over here? We all have this analytics, and now we have this monetization stat. So I think that's that's going to be part of the deal there. Um on the Room Composer, this is still on Android only, but we hope to see that next week. But yeah, they, we talked about it last week. It's just help you get the room set up in advance. Um, but I haven't been able to play it yet, with it yet, so I can't really say much more. Um, and there's something bubbling away in the code that I've seen a little peek of, but it's not something that's been hinted at or talked about. So I can mention that very briefly and just... I don't know if we'll see it by the end of the year. I hope so. But it looks like they're building, I think I talked about this a little bit last week, but they're building an interesting way for people who are in a room to share it. So I know on Twitter, you can tweet out a room or you could, you know, quote tweet something and encourage people to join it. Well, Clubhouse are building something similar for, for sharing the room within the app. Um, and you're gonna be able to share a room with the rest of Clubhouse and add a little bit of text, again, looks a bit like a quote tweet, and sounds like it, to say why people should come into the room. And this is also going to be, this is the thing I discovered today, it's going to be part of the engagement metrics that they're going to show creators and speakers. So any speaker on the stage will be able to tap and see who has shared that room and what they said about it. So they'll be able to see who are the most engaged listeners. In. And this is part of the first push with the Clubhouse Analytics to identify who keeps coming to your room regularly, who is engaged, who recommends it to others, and what do they say? So you can find out who the core contributors are to the community or So yeah, This is all coming together now, and we expect to see the monetization rollout proper have in the first few months of next year. So yeah, that, that's, that's the Clubhouse News this week. Wow, what a roundup. <laughs> Thank you, Morgan. I mean, it certainly sounds like they're as you say, really building on those analytics and then pushing that through so that creators can find out more about their audience. Um, the idea that we'll be able to share rooms within the platform, as you say, sounds a little bit like a tweet in some respects, um, which is quite interesting. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah. have no idea how it would appear, where mm. you would see it, how they're going to mediate it. Like, does it go to everybody surely not is there a fee maybe not yeah. but it, it feels to me very much like they're they're thinking about how you would share things on twitter and then not implementing that but just think the core principles behind that like how you yeah. recommend something with people who are you know maybe beyond the people you follow and how cool. do you have some kind of interaction with the speaker um so like, if, if i was to tweet this room at mention the hosts, you would see that I'd shared it and you would probably see what I said about it. So you have some idea and it's a way of me having a background connection with this. Um, and this is gonna do a similar kind of thing, I think, without the kind of at mentioning apparatus. Excuse me, can I make a comment? This is Maria. Oh. Um, hi, just about Clubhouse in general. I just think it's so interesting the way they're uh, maneuvering around this replay feature. It is definitely more of a podcast feel to it. And I'm wondering, you know, what the incentive is for people to actually go into rooms now because they do have the option to hear the replay. Obviously, the first thing is if you want your voice to be heard, you want to be on time and you want to get up on that stage if that's your your thing and to be heard yourself as part of the conversation. But I think it's going to be really interesting how 
it all rolls out because it's definitely feeling more like a podcast to me now. And you're absolutely right. I mean, paying attention to those numbers matters for people who are seeking sponsorship. And it's probably a good time right now to start building your rooms, I guess, to get ready for that to happen, right? Yeah. And I I think that's where people who were there kind of at the very beginning and and building up and and talking to kind of effectively very few people in in the first place will will push forward I think leaps and bounds as this goes on um which is where it was always very interesting to watch how how that would happen but it certainly sounds like they're sort of pushing the elasticated edges of what their app is and trying to work out how they can expand it in in different ways and in ways that potentially we hadn't even really considered that they would um so yeah all super interesting really um got our eye on that one as we go into the new year to see what they've got in store for us for 2022 but thank you so much Morgan for coming along again today and for letting us know what's going on over in Clubhouse it's um it's really appreciated thank you to all of our speakers who came on and uh shared so much great stuff and we're available in all of your favorite podcast apps we're out there uh, all things audio you can also go to all things audio podcast.com as well you certainly can and you can catch us here on twitter and use the hashtag all things audio and we'll pick that up throughout the week so that's it for this week but thank you so much to everyone that's been here in the space with us and those of you listening and we'll catch up with you next week bye everybody